Hello everyone, this is the next lecture of product realization technology. In the previous lecture, we discussed the fundamentals of the casting process. So you know that casting process is used, um, you know, traditionally in manufacturing and also in modern days, casting is still one of the most uh, extensively used process. All right. So what is casting? We take a molten material. In most cases, it is metal. And then we pour it inside a mold, uh, which contains a cavity which is of the same shape that you want to manufacture. And this cavity is known as the pattern cavity. How do we make that cavity? By using something known as a pattern. So this is the shape which we first put inside our mold, then we prepare the mold, then we remove the pattern and instead we fill the metal. So this is the fundamental idea. Now, today we are going to discuss what are different types of casting. We will also uh, talk a little bit about the defects during casting and also the parameters that need to be controlled during casting, right? So if I'm asking you to perform casting, uh, what would be the optimum way? How will you be more efficient? Okay, so let's start with the types of casting or the classification of casting. So whatever I want to say, most of it is already on this slide. Casting, like other processes, can also be uh, you know, classified in various ways. For example, uh, whether it is traditional or modern, whether it is used for ferrous materials or non-ferrous materials, whether it is used for metals or non-metals. So there are casting processes that can uh, be that are in principle applicable to polymers as well, but we don't call them casting. We call them different types of molding processes. For example, injection molding because the temperatures there are much different compared to what we use for metals. So casting can also be in broad way different classified in a, in, a, in a many different uh, manners. But this is the most common classification. And this is, as you can see, based on the type of mold that is used. So here you see two terms, expendable and non expendable molds. OK, what is expendable? Expendable casting or the entire process is where the mold can be reused and non expendable where the mold cannot be reused. So be careful with these terminologies because expendable cannot be used and non expendable that that means mold can be used. OK, fine. So now if you think about it now, we have mainly discussed sand mold in this, uh, you know, in the previous lecture also. And that is what is relevant to you also. This is kind of the most uh, uh, common technique, uh, sand molds, and that is what you will be also performing in your experiments. So that is where I paid attention. But that is not the only way. There can be many other processes, many other types of making the mold. And you now also see that sometimes mold is also reusable. Okay, so we will not go into the details. I will just tell you the fundamentals, the, the different types of casting processes. But what you're going to actually perform in the lab is going to be just the sand based uh, casting. OK, so let's first go into this this uh, ex expendable mode, expendable again mode. So if you want to remember this, just remember the expendable is sand cast. Sand is something that you will just shake off and remove once your uh, once whatever part you wanted to make is done. You know, the, it is the metal has solidified then or cooled down. Then what will you do? You will just get rid of the mold. And since it is a sand mold, since it is also uh, not very expensive, you can just remove it and shake it off. And then, you know, once everything is cooled down, then you can just remove the remaining uh, sand and then you can perform the polishing and whatever other, um, you know, next secondary operations you need to perform. OK, so expendable one is sand casting. But before that, there is something written as permanent pattern casting. So this is not just the mold. Now we are also talking about the pattern here. Pattern again. Remember what is that pattern? Is the very in the very beginning um, something made of wood or metal that you used for making the pattern cavity? That was your pattern, right? Now again, the pattern can also be either permanent or temporary. So I said that you use wood or metal. That would mean it is permanent. But if I use a pattern made of wax, so that I don't need to put in too much effort in removing it, what I can then do is I can just melt it away. So if I make my initial pattern of wax and then I put it inside any cast, which may or may not be sand cast, but I can melt it and somehow there should be some channel for the for the wax to go out. But I can simply, uh, you know, get rid of the pattern. So the pattern can also be permanent or temporary. Now, sand casting comes under this very, very first type where you have the mold that because it's sand mold, it cannot be reused, but the pattern 
is the same every time you um, you make your new mold. So that is the type which is known as permanent pattern casting. Now there is also another plaster mold casting which is very similar to sand mold casting except the fact that the refractory material that you're using is made of typically plaster of Paris. So there are all these um, ceramic materials and combinations of ceramic materials and clay and all of these things which can be in principle molded. So all of these things can be used as uh, mold materials. Now of course this will depend also upon what is the highest temperature that you want to uh, where you want to perform your casting so low melting uh, point metals will have different uh, so aluminum for example will have different types of cast compared to um, you know uh, ferrous materials or any other uh, very high temperature metals and so on okay so that is the first type the second type is temporary pattern so now you already i already gave you the example of wax pattern but you can also have patterns that are made of materials that directly evaporate so wax melts but there are materials such as polystyrene foam these materials when you pour really hot metal and remember the metal that we are pouring here is above 700 degrees centigrade in some cases even above 1000 so this these are very high temperatures so certain materials such as styrofoam can actually completely evaporate so in that case of course your pattern is temporary but your mold is also temporary so both of these things are now temporary in the sense that you cannot reuse either of them so in the case of wax or in the case of um, evaporate the materials that evaporate now wax will actually come into the second type which is known as investment investment casting in investment casting we mainly we use it for small parts a lot of small parts like if i need to make one large part maybe i will not go for investment casting but if i want to make for example turbine blades or something the this part size is not very um, you know large so let's say this big hmm, this big is what 15 centimeters so something like 15 to 20 centimeter even up to one meter but if i want to make the same kind of uh, you know uh, design or same kind of part multiple times all the blades of the turbine need to be of the same shape right so in that case what i can do is i can make a tree like structure tree means you have some you know sort of stick like thing in the middle and then you have multiple branches and multiple pattern patterns arranged on the same one big uh, sort of assembly and then you pour the entire assembly inside a ceramic slurry and then you get get rid of the of the pattern which in this particular case is often made of wax so you can melt it away and there should be def de definitely cavities or chan channels to melt away the wax and this is how you perform investment casting okay fine so now this was all about expendable mold which means that mold is not reusable but how can we reuse a mold so now you know that if you make a pattern and then you have just sand around it you can get rid of it but if you cannot get rid of the mold that means you need to make sure that your whatever structure you're making whatever um, you know solidified metal or shape you have that does not stick to the mold because otherwise how will you remove it so often in this uh, these uh, different types of casting processes what you have is you put some oil or some kind of uh, you know specific lubricant material sometimes even powders or even abrasive ref refractory materials so the mold is not sticking to your uh, to the surface of your uh, uh, whatever your design you're making the part, uh, the part okay now again within non-expandable there are different types of casting processes one very common one is known as die casting. Die casting is used for making a lot of things, things like um, coins, for example. So die casting has a specific shape. Your mold itself will have a specific shape. And then you will press your molten metal with a lot of pressure inside it. So that is how it goes inside the die. And then it hits it. And then you have your shape ready. So that is your die casting process. Centrifugal casting, as the name suggests, there is some sort of centrifugal force. Centrifugal means something is rotating here. So what is often happening in this case, your entire part, wherever, whatever you want to make, so imagine some sort of a you know tumbler or mug or something like that, that is rotating when you fill the metal into it. And now you can imagine what kind of shapes do we make? We can make easily hollow shapes using this uh, centrifugal casting because now we don't need an additional 
insert to make the shape hollow right because the metal is only it, it has this center because of the centrifugal uh, you know because of the rotation it is only going on the sides okay so this is another type which is uh, where you can again reuse the mold okay what else there is something known as pressure casting or often known as low pressure casting so i told you that in the case of die casting also you will inject your material with um, you know you know with some pressure low pressure casting is something similar but this is also used uh, for lower temperature materials so for example non ferrous metals such as aluminum there people use low pressure casting but the idea is the same you again inject the uh, metal with uh, or inject or pour the metal but at relatively low pressure but the idea is that it goes inside the mold and takes the shape and then once it is solidified it comes out so these are different types of casting processes again as i mentioned that for you at this point the first one is most important the sand casting okay now how do you what do you do if you want to make a good part as i said you need to control several parameters what are the possible parameters to control okay in the case of sand cast think about it what are the things that you need to know you must be thinking now since you've not performed any experiments right now you must be thinking that huh the sand is sand is something very rough right and maybe it will not be stable maybe there is some sort of sliding on the sand maybe some sand will sag and yes all these things do happen but we can also control the properties of the sand control the properties of the things that we mix in the sand so that it stays and it binds very nicely at least during the process what else we also are performing our process at very high temperature which means there is something about temperature control as well we need to make sure that the material whether it is sand or anything else that you know plaster whatever we are using for as the mold material that material does not deform at high temperatures so all of these things we can control and here are so all these things that i have mentioned here are some of the things that you will uh, you know you will need to control in fact if you want to uh, get a reasonable uh, shape out of it so first thing is particle size of sand so i was just saying that sand um, you know can can get displaced from its position sand can also have porosity there can be all these problem many of them can be avoided if you have a very uniform particle size so sand particle also it's not just about uniform it has to be a certain size within that range you need to have your size. if you have very big grains of sand or if you have extremely small grains of sand both may not work so you need to optimize the particle size of sand and also make sure that you have more or less uniform particle size so that is one thing that you control what else content of additives so in our previous lecture we learned that um, there are certain additives binders and so on mixed into the sand and you also have certain fraction of clay now i also told you that the clay fraction is different for ferrous and non ferrous materials so all of these things according to your very specific part you need to optimize and you need to make sure that those things are um, you know present during your experiment or your uh, when you are manufacturing something okay what else this one very important thing moisture content you would think that moisture will not make too much difference because we have organic binders and other things but moisture content in fact uh, now in the next couple of slides when i'll talk about defects you will see that a lot of uh, you know defects occur if you have moisture in your sand again remember we are working at very high temperature so if you have water then that water will also evaporate or any other type of gases present in the system your within your flask or even sometimes if there are impurities in your metal there may be even organic impurities if you have uh, you know some metal which is not uh, purified properly which is not processed properly so any kind of gases any kind of bubbles even steam bubbles <coughs> can actually cause defects so moisture content is very important you need to make sure that you have the optimum content because also it should not be completely dry otherwise it will not bind properly so this is yet another thing the compression strength of sand or any refractory material that you are using that is important of course otherwise once you pour the molten metal it can expand and it can even uh, there may be cracks generated and so on what else <coughs> the mold design of course 
the placement of riser and gate is very very important so the gate should not be extremely thin if it is extremely thin then you may not have proper flow of the metal but at the same time if it is very thick then you may end up getting uh, you know some bubbles or uh, uh, some gases inside it and also it will be difficult to break it off later on so and also similar things for the position of uh, riser you according to the shape different shapes may even require the placement of riser at a different location because it depends riser you know what does riser do it will give extra metal when during solidification there is a shrinkage created so it needs to basically refill the structure wherever there is a empty space and for that purpose you need to place it in a very optimum position so all of these things they come under the design of your mold design of your pattern so pattern design mold design pattern material mold material all of these things become important and according to very specific design and very specific metal that you are working with okay what else is some other things that i have mentioned the permeability of mold maybe these things will also become more clear when we talk about the defects into the uh, uh, in the coming slides because defects are often created when we do not optimize some of these parameters acha pouring temperature of metal so till now we were talking about just the design and the aspects of mold and you know the material of mold and pattern but what is also important is the um, you know the parameters related to the material that you are pouring right so in most cases you have what is known as superheated uh, metals or superheated materials superheated means if something already melts at 600 i heat it up to 700 so it is we don't need to just pour the metal right at the uh, you know melting point it will be molten metal but what we need is we need to allow enough time we need to provide it enough time before solidification you know that it should not happen that the first thing the first drop that goes in already solidifies and then the you know it could cannot go inside the cavities or the design that you the intricate shapes that you have made so we need to provide more heat more temperature uh, than what it needs for melting so in most cases you have superheated metals and that temperature is also very very important by the way this is done in large furnaces sometimes these furnaces are directly connected to your casting uh, station so from the furnace you don't have to you know collect the metal and pour it or something it can be directly poured the the metal can be directly poured um inside your mold in fact in most of the industrial process that is how it is done but when people are performing uh, casting individually casting is a very common process you will even see it in the villages It's, many people are doing it so in that case they may take the molten metal from the furnace and then manually pour it inside the mold okay um yeah for in time you can imagine that if i just throw in the entire uh, metal then i'm going to have um, bubbles or all kind of problems right so pouring time and how you know pouring method all these things are very important so these are some of the parameters that you need to control now i have also prepared this little chart which again tells you the steps in the casting process <clears throat> okay so first thing you do is melting of the metal then you pour it into the mold now whatever is happening is actually the casting process and then you can now you are then you have the solidification right so casting includes solidification after that if you want you can also perform further heat treatment for certain parts because heat treatment of a you know metal often can in if there are little slight defects or cracks or something they can get filled out so you can perform further baking or heat treatment in some cases then you perform the cleaning get rid of the mold and everything and then you finally perform the inspection for defects so these are some of the steps okay here i have not mentioned how you uh, you know make the pattern and how you make the mold okay why i mention these steps is because i want to tell you that at each step you may need to have certain or you may need to you know pay attention to a certain parameter okay so melting of metal well what parameter the most important parameter during melting is the temperature of your metal and that is what i was saying that you usually have superheated metal you need to make sure that your furnace is working properly and the temperature that you have set is the actual temperature okay you also need to make sure that there are no uh, you know not too many heat losses you also need to make sure that during the pouring process there are not too many heat losses right because otherwise if it comes or the molten metal comes in contact of the uh, environment it can very fast cool down and it might solidify even before or even if there are particles 
of uh, you know solid metal inside the liquid metal that also can ruin your structure so all of these things you need to take care of so temperature parameters are most important in the very very initial phase when you're melting the metal when you pour it into the mold then of course you need to, the most important thing you need to take care of is the shrinkage and the shrinkage is caused by solidification process so you also need to understand the solidification mechanism of your material right so you need to understand for example the crystal structure what kind of material it is and how long does it take what is the um, you know different properties of the material itself you need to understand and here some defects may be created although we cannot we cannot do anything at this point we just can make sure that we don't have you know we pour it in such a way that to minimize the defects but at this point we cannot really get rid of the defects okay then the casting is done and after casting what do you do shake out so this is particularly for a sand uh, mold right so shake out means um, you need to get rid of your mold so sand or plaster of paris or these kind of ceramic molds i'm talking about also in the case of uh, investment casting it is important so now you get rid of your mold and you also get rid of your riser and gates so this is something you do after the casting what else so i said that additional heat treatment but only if needed not in all cases but in some cases you can often people do it just to uh, sort of improve the surface properties as well okay what else then you perform the cleaning and finishing dimension check tightness check because you wanted to make something and you don't even know if that is exactly what it what came out or you know the tolerances are met or not and then finally during inspection after post processing you will make sure that you meet the dimensions and you also now check for details uh, check for defects in detail right and if you figure out that there's certain type of defect maybe during your next process you will um, you know you will take care that that does not happen and now in the next couple of slides i'll tell you what are casting defects